Good morning. So, how many of you were totally impressed with my colleague's presentation, Dr. Tom Levy? Was that awesome? Did he give you the data that should persuade anyone that infection is that important and degenerative disease is that important? You know, as a physician, I got prosecuted by the State Medical Board in the early 1990s for claiming. It was never for what I did with patients, but what I wrote. And I claimed that, that inflammation was the root of all degenerative diseases. How dare you? How dare that's, that's what they thought. It was 10 years later before JAMA actually published their first article on that. So the, the real question comes down to how do we take care of patients if we have a deeper understanding of the pathology, the processes. And I want to send you, I'm going to give you your take-home message now. Right now, it's two things, and that's it, okay? Number one, we die from injuries. And number two, we die from infections. So when, with regard to injuries, you can also include chemical and toxic metal injuries and so on. But those are the two causes, and that's the take-home message today. We're going to talk about deep blood fungus, dental and other connections to the devastating illnesses. And... Uh, this, I hope, will be an eye-opener. You know, if you search Dr. Google for deep blood fungus, which happens to be my, my term, okay, 100% of the time you will find only my reference to it because nobody else is really on board with this, and yet they should be. In 1891, a dentist, Willoughby Miller, outlined the concept of periodontal disease and systemic illness. He called it the dental cosmos, that the mouth was this microorganism entrance to the body. Current estimates are that about 75% of the North American population has periodontal disease. I personally think that's probably an underestimate. About a third of all Americans skip an annual dental visit, but you know, they don't seem to have any systemic signs of infection, so who cares? Well, the reason to care is because untreated periodontal disease generates a destructive immune response that elevates systemic inflammation. Oh, wait a minute, inflammation, that's what we've been talking about for the last couple of days. And all of these inflammations and infections are accumulating on biofilms, and indeed the largest areas for your biofilms are your mouth, your lungs, and your gut. About a 45 to 50% increase in the risk for periodontal disease was found in those people with obesity, likely related to the inflammation characteristics of, of uh, white fat. Now, fatty tissue produces these mediators leading to systemic inflammation, and that also exaggerates the response to periodontal infection. A study based in Sweden showed that young individuals with periodontitis and missing molars were at increased risk for premature death. Oh, wait a minute, you're just missing uh, some molars, and now you've got the periodontitis. Well, neoplasms, diseases of the circulatory and digestive systems, what do they have to do with anything except for the fact that we're talking about inflammatory disease? But not to worry. Of the thousands of species of fungi, only a few can cause a disease or discomfort in people. You go, wait a minute, where'd that slide come from? Because, you know, we think of infection in terms of bacterial. Maybe we could call it viral. But for the most part, we're thinking bacteria. And what I'm going to introduce to you today is a complete revision of that approach. We've got antibiotics for bacterial infections, very few for fungal. And, you know, one of the characteristics in modern medicine is if you don't have a treatment for it, you don't look for it. What you don't look for, you don't find. What you don't find, you don't treat. What you don't treat, don't get better. Well, that kind of condemns our patient population to an endless degree of suffering. But the good news is, according to, you know, the studies, uh, uh, just only a few fungi can create disease problems. And so I'm going to give you an idea about swordfish. You look at a swordfish and you go, that looks dangerous to me. So it would be more obvious that that would be a problem, and indeed, swordfishies can be a problem. You know, if they're sticking through you, that's inconvenient. I would like you to give me a vote. Who do you think won this encounter, the submarine or the swordfish? And yeah, we'll go with the submarine on that one. Now, 
Here's a sturgeon. Doesn't look so threatening. I mean, it looks like, you know, this is not going to be, we'll call this a fungus then. Did you know that a sturgeon can leap six feet out of the water? That means that they can leap into a boat. And indeed, people have been killed by sturgeons, not so obviously nasty. Yeah, that too. You can leave off the tea and we've got the same result, okay? But the sturgeons leaping into a boat can be just as deadly as a swordfish. They don't look as ominous. So my question to you, and I'll take this vote, which of these three kingdoms poses the greatest threat to your health? Saudi Arabia, Jordan, or Texas? There you go. <laughs> so actually, if you scratch off Texas and put fungus, which of these really is the greatest threat to your health? We don't think of it as fungus. I want us to rethink our thinking. There are three great kingdoms. One, two, three. Plant, animal, fungus. Now, the distinction is based on their energy production system. So a plant takes sunlight, combines it, and makes energy on its own. Now, animals eat plants. Animals eat other animals that ate plants. Fungus eats plants. Fungus eats animals. In other words, the fungal kingdom uses plants and animals as their source of energy. So here's my question. Who's the best, biggest, baddest kingdom of all? Now think of it like this. Plants have to have sunlight, and then they get along with most any environment. You know, if you don't want them to grow in certain parts of your yard, make sure that you tell them that, and that's where they'll grow. <laughs> like in the driveway, right? But the deal is this. If animals and plants get along, that's great. But fungus, if it doesn't outsmart the defense systems that the plants and the animals are putting up, fungus dies. It doesn't have any other options. There's no other choices. It is that most important kingdom. And indeed, the members of the kingdom are yeast and fungus, mold and mildew. They're basically all the same. They have one, one dictum, and that is survive or die. So if they have to survive or die, compromised patients are their best friend. HIV infection, cancer treatment. I'll say that three times. Cancer treatment, cancer treatment. Because what we do is we kill the patient with the treatment more than we do with the cancer. That's just a personal opinion. Corticosteroids, easily available. Immunosuppressants and frequent antibiotics. It distresses me immensely to have patients come in and say, well, I went to the urgent care or whatever, and they gave me what basically is a fourth generation antibiotic for a super simple infection. Really? And we wonder why antibiotic usage is so out of balance and works so ineffectively in so many ways. Compromised patients also include those with chronic infections. Would that include periodontal disease, nutritional deficiencies, toxic chemicals, toxic metals. Those are the two unappreciated environmental poisons that we have. Hormonal imbalances, increasingly a problem because of the other items listed here. And stressful lifestyles. We do have stressful lifestyles. We get up early, we go to bed late, and we design all sorts of demands on our life and our time rather than learning to cope with them well. We are just putting a finger in the dike in our life. We are, for the most part, inadequately managing our days and our nights. And that is what's putting us at real risk for things. Now, fungi can produce two kinds of human infections, systemic ones that affect the internal organs, and superficial ones that affect the skin, the nails, and the hair. Now, you might also call superficial infections the ones that affect the oropharyngeal cavity, the sinuses, the lungs, and so on. But, you know, there's kind of a crossover where you're actually talking about deeper organ systems. I think when you're talking sinuses, I think when you're talking lungs, even though they have an immediate connection to the outside. So just think of it that way. Here's something trivial, you know, just a fungal infection on the skin, no big deal. Here's another 
fungal infection on the skin. It's kind of a ringworm pattern, no big deal. This is more a psoriatic fungal pattern. Here's severe onychomycosis. Now, you know, this is the kind of stuff that we see everywhere in the older populations. You go into the nursing homes, it's unusual to find good-looking nails. Now, you have to realize that that's because the defense system is compromised and is not reaching those areas, is not defending you, and the fungus is getting a <laughs> toehold. How's that? <laughs> so the deal is, is that that infection now begins to set the stage for you to be a compromised individual. You can have a vitiligo pattern. Uh, no big deal. It's just a skin discoloration, except, wait a minute, why are you tolerating that? Here's a sad story I want to tell you. This is just an example of diaper rash. One of my staff members recently has a new grandson. It's a great idea, wonderful thing. <laughs> except, except he develops a rash. So they go to their pediatrician. Now, the pediatrician looks at this. Whoa. You know, the mom had a, 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 a group B streptococcal infection when the child was born by C-section, so it's not like there was an obvious connection. But the child had tried nursing, and the kid is getting loved and licked on by mama and so on. So he says they need to go to the emergency room. So they go to the hospital emergency room for a diaper rash. Well, it was kind of flaming and didn't look comfortable. <clears throat> Nine hours later, blood tests, CT scan, lumbar puncture, cultures, oh yeah, oh yeah, and, and the attempt to get a urine specimen by catheterization, which boogers up poor little kids like that. And you go, okay, and what did they conclude? They concluded that the appropriate treatment was ambulance transfer to Texas Children's Hospital. This is last week I'm talking about. This is not like ancient medicine. It is ancient medicine, but it's being practiced today. All right. They walk in the door at Texas Children's, get shown into a room. The resident comes in, looks and goes, hmm. looks like a diaper rash. No shit, Sherlock. So anyway, <laughs> so the resident goes, gets a senior resident, probably the ID on, on call for the emergency, walks in and goes, yep, diaper rash. And they get the prescription for nice statin cream, goodbye. Now, mind you, this is about 18 hours after we started with the pediatrician. You know why there's pediatricians is because grandma lives 1,500 miles away. Okay, Grandma would have said, oh, that's a diaper rash, no big deal. This is how we enlarge the incredible, ineffective, costly practice of medicine in our view lately. But what about, let's take some other things. What about knee pain? Now, that's not fungal the way we think of it. What about infections in the base of teeth? That's not fungal the way we think of it. What about periodontal disease? Well, that could have a fungal element, but I doubt it. We should just treat it with antibiotics, right? What if the combination is what you're going to miss and you're going to allow increased growth of the fungal infection? Abscessed teeth, root canals by definition are abscessed teeth. These are the areas where I'm suggesting if we're not thinking fungal, we're not thinking. How about all the other lesions that we get to see inside the mouth, including simple ones like tonsillitis. You know, when I treat patients with infections, what I conclude to be bacterial infections, I am also giving them antifungal medication. Why? Because they have a concomitant fungal infection, by definition. Now, if you don't culture it, you don't find it, right? Uh, if you do culture it, you probably don't find it. You have to use Saberod's auger. This could take weeks before you know, the fungus grows out. And then you're just going to say, well, we couldn't grow enough to identify it. By definition, we have a concomitant infection. So treat them both. And after the antibiotics are done, I still include a few more days of the antifungal medication because you have some residual antibiotic activity that still could stimulate fungal growth. 
And then, of course, we're into the probiotic, prebiotic return of normal gut function. Boy, that's a big one, too. How about that little infection there? Probably not a big deal. I don't know. It is for that tooth, isn't it? And don't forget the miles and miles of dentin tubules inside that have been impacted by that infection and are transmitting infection to the body. This, of course, means that there will be no more transfer of infection because we have solved that problem. Now we're just poisoning the body with all of that mercury. Ah, beautiful root canals. In fact, nothing wrong with them except for the fact they are highly infected. Now we think of infected as bacterial, but what I want you to think of is bacteria plus fungus. Because if we completely treat the problem, then we're doing a good job for people. How about post and place those tubes? Well, okay. Except that's a fomite. That's not you now. I think this is a serious problem that we don't recognize when we implant all these joints in people. We've now just put something in that is a surface that is going to happily grow infection. What kind? Well, we're going to look for bacterial and probably not find it because we're pretty convinced in our own minds that it's sterile bacterial wise we don't check for fungus but if you did check for fungus you couldn't actually demonstrate it because it's hard to identify what about kids who just have funny looking tongues or even funnier looking tongues on adults and such the oral pharyngeal cavity is loaded with places to tuck abscesses not just bacterial but also fungal and remember if you have fungal growth or overgrowth in the mouth tissues you're going to have fungal abscesses as well now we'll think of them as bacterial we'll do IND we'll do antibiotics we'll do whatever and we will miss completely and leave behind the residue of fungal infection which of course poses special challenges to survival people get fungal infections in the lungs we hardly ever see them and treat them now it should be easy to treat this. In 1986, I published a book which kind of talked about the yeast syndrome and how basically you could get fixed by doing the proper treatments for yeast, mold, mildew, fungus. It should be easy. Unfortunately, the doctors don't believe it. Uh, we suffer because the doctors don't believe it. Now remember, it doesn't matter how smart your doctor is. It matters how good your doctor is. I define good as someone who's able to take care of the problem easily, less complicated, safely as possible. Not just he's able to address your issues and write you prescriptions, which incidentally can be done in under eight minutes in an office visit. But that's all right. Some of the doctors take 15 to achieve the same inadequate, ineffective treatment program. And we suffer. Now, we can get fungal infections by contact, we can get them from the mouth, from periodontal and other illnesses in the mouth. We get them from the genital organs. That's because everywhere you have a wet surface that converts to a dry surface, like lips and vaginal lips and so on, you have a very tenuous biological area. Here's another tenuous biological area. Hal Huggins, before he died, was doing some interesting thinking about the fact that teeth were different than gums and bone. And here teeth are sitting in gums and bone. And that he was toying with the possibility that unerupted teeth would actually serve as a nidus in the 40s and 50s to encourage the development of autoimmune disease. I said, Hal, that's a really provocative thought. I wish I were as smart as he were to keep thinking about that, but certainly the infections in the base of the teeth are, I think, very provocative for human illness. How about gut infections? You know, we don't see the gut, and as long as you don't complain about the gut, then we just kind of assume you're okay. What if you're not? And indeed, you know, the biochemical tests are needed to diagnose leaky gut. The biochemical tests are needed to determine whether or not you have, you know, hypochloridria or ineffective uh, pancreatic acids or juices from the, from the liver, the bile, and so on. <coughs> Sinuses. 
We had such a lovely demonstration on sinuses yesterday, and the point is very simple. Yes, these areas need to be cleaned out, but what do they irrigate with? Antibacterial. What do they subsequently treat with? Antibacterial. Now, fundamental thing, just to remind you of the original microbiology, antibiotics that suppress the growth of bacteria will tend to increase the growth of other things like fungus because the antibacterial antibiotics are not treating fungus. It has no or reduced competitors now, and it can grow and flourish. It just does it in a different way, and we see it less easily. Here's a good example. What about balls in the lungs? You get stuff like that. What's the immediate first concern? Cancer. Now you have cancer. And the question is, what if it's just a fungal ball? Actually, it turns out that if your doctors, rather than just treat, will go in and biopsy, some of these things are clusters of fungus. What a thought. Remember, you can get exposure by breathing things in. People do not get sick because of their DNA. We do not have genetic illnesses as we're kind of told we have. Well, you know, you have to get your, your, your genetic uh, SNPs done because that'll tell you what to avoid and things like that. Those are epigenetics issues. In other words, healthy lifestyle is how we stay healthy. And epigenetics are of little interest except in people who have specific Symptoms. Let's think of genetics like the library you get from your parents. These are the potential books you could read. Epigenetics are the ones you select to pull off the shelf and read. And if you change your lifestyle, for instance, toward a more Mediterranean diet instead of McDonald's, then you change the books that you read in your genetic library. And that can create dramatically greater health. And as Dr. Levy suggested, perhaps that's responsible for the people who do a better job of creating vitamin C inside their system. But what do we do instead? Well, we jam medicines down our throat. You know, a pill is the answer to most problems. Okay. And remember, you don't have to treat the patient. You can treat the paper. All you have to do is get the lab report. In fact, you don't even have to touch the patient anymore. Just get the paper. Just get the report. And that's how a lot of medicine is done because it's so A to B. You don't have to enter space thinking anywhere in between that. We also get sick, and especially with yeast, because of birth control and other hormones because they distort the patterns. These are not bioidentical and in natural levels and in natural balances. We also have over-the-counter cortisone now. It's not bad enough that cortisone, a very powerful and very useful drug, it's not bad enough that it's, you know, starting to get available. It's pushed and advertised as readily available. And that creates more skin zone problems because you've now suppressed the appearance of a fungal infection. And therefore, it's not likely to get treated. And now you have another entry point for the body. Remember that the basics for healthy living are not the food triangle promoted by the government. Oh, boy. I don't know what we're going to do with these people. Maybe ignore them. I would suggest ignoring the government might be much more beneficial for your health. That's what I talked about in 1986. I have not changed my views at all. One of the slogans I have is don't stay sick. D is for dietary changes. O is over-the-counter Nutritional support, general vitamins and minerals and stuff. And as for nutritional supplements specific for challenges and people who get yeast infection have very specific challenges, for instance, magnesium, vitamin B6, essential fatty acids. And then T is treatment with simple antifungal medications. This is for the yeast syndrome. Okay, but we're going to start getting into a little bit deeper stuff here. Mold spores and their mycotoxins enter the body by breathing, by swallowing, and by skin. Mycotoxins. All of a sudden, I'm starting to talk about mold spores and not just simple yeast things associated with bacterial infections and such. And indeed, what I want to talk about is stratification. Stratification is like what you see with the laying down of layers for mountains and such. And you can clearly see that there are distinctive levels and layers 
You go, wait a minute, so what does that have to do with yeast and mold and fungus and whatever? Well, in my work in the last three years, I have seen the yeast syndrome as a superficial layer of illness issues, and a lot of them. I mean, you know, people come in with a whole lot of complaints, and mostly they're related to the yeast syndrome, and if you treat that, a lot of those things just go away and they heal up. But there is a deeper level of illness that we're now beginning to classify as deep blood fungus. Now again, that's my terminology because you'll see at the end, how do we really define this? Well, what are distressing diseases for deep blood fungus? Rheumatoid arthritis, systemic lupus, ALS, MS, leukemia, leukopenia, all cancers, severe skin disorders, and unexplained immune system disorders recurrent infection patterns, virtually all other unexplained, puzzling, frustrating diseases. Now, I don't have a thousand slides to go through, so does that kind of summarize it? So, your aunt now came down with da-da-da-da-da, the, you know, the I don't know them, Noma, okay, I don't Noma, I love that term. Guess what she's probably got? Deep blood fungus. Deep blood fungus, because the simple things like a simple yeast infection and stuff that we can come up with and figure out, and, and mostly that's clinical history. There is an antibody test, but you have to understand how to interpret antibody responses. But deep blood fungus is something which, when treated, can help these conditions. Now, when we're talking about puzzling, devastating diseases that can be helped, why is it doctors say, we don't know how to help you, there's nothing that can help you? They're lying. They're lying because they're ignoring the prospect that infection could be the root of these weird diseases, these puzzling, devastating diseases. The reason that I know they're ignoring that is because my book was written 32 years ago and is still dismissed as just nothing, even though there's about 100 scientific references in it from back then. And it's more true today than it ever was. They're lying. So let's take rheumatoid arthritis and protozoa. Toxoplasma, elevated antibody levels in RA patients. 42% of patients with autoimmune antibodies display positive IgG titers compared to 29% of controls. So in other words, it's something a little bit more common in RA patients. Europeans displayed correlations that are as good. What about rheumatoid arthritis and fungi? Now we're talking a little bit different, but high antibody levels to Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Now that's a common you know, mold and, and you know, yeast that we really use. Well, how about 40% in RA patients and 5.3% in NC cell patients, okay? The, slightly different group, but elevated levels of IgA against Saccharomyces in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Simple conclusion, you go, well, that's just because they have a distorted immune system, or let's do the chicken and egg thing. Maybe they have a distorted immune system because they have a fungal infection. And indeed, when I treat them like that, guess who gets better? How about coronary artery plaque? Remember I said, that you die from two things, injuries and infections. What if what we think of like, oh, a heart attack, and it's neither one of those. What if it's actually an infection that's happening in the heart arteries and leading to a mechanical problem and we get dead? Well, fungal DNA signatures in heart artery plaques, 92% of samples in 38 cases from coronary atherectomy, where they actually pulled the plaque out. 92% is a little bit high in my estimation. I'm like Dr. Levy, I don't know math very well, but it seems like a lot to me. And if it's more because we just don't have the technology to easily see it, then it's really more. And what about biofilm in arterial plaque? You know, the, most of these images are from the Fry Lab here in Scottsdale because they've been doing really phenomenal work on looking at these deeper involvements. And if you take a look at the biofilm on arterial plaque, they keep finding signatures of eukaryocytes. 
Now, those aren't bacteria. Those are more advanced organisms like fungus and their brethren. Now, if we can find this there, is it the reason why that is there? Is it the reason why perhaps your body is setting up a defense system trying to isolate that stuff and now it just mechanically gets in the way of circulation? Populations in carotid plaque. I want you to see at the end here the, the last three that are listed right down there are Spumella perkinsis and Okramona species. Wait a minute. They're in pretty high concentrations compared to the other things. And remember, this is plaque taken out of, coronary, of uh, carotid arteries. And, you know, they're looking for bacterial involvement and so on. And what they're finding is these, not prokaryocytes, but eukaryocytes, more advanced organisms along the lines of parasites and fungus. Now, what are the most common eukaryotes in chronically ill patients? Number one, if you remember nothing else, Remember, Phenelliformis. It has a great name, Phenelliformis mosii. It is a fungus that infects in the roots of various plants. It is the most prominent one we find, which would suggest somehow it has figured how to get inside us and survive. Then Perkinsa species, these come from oysters. Saccharomyces, this is from uh, a variety of food sources and such. The most common ones include Hydrurus and Spumella and Saccharomyces toxoplasma gondii, but the number one is the Phenelliformis. This thing literally lives inside the cells of the roots of these plants. And why does it do that? Because it increases their hydration. You get bigger, better plants. It also seems to grab hold of toxic metals and keep them from affecting the plant. So there is a positive benefit of that sitting out there in the plant kingdom. There's not such a positive benefit in the animal kingdom. That would be us. Now, here's the glitch in the system. What is that doing inside us? How is that doing inside us? Is it a marker or is it a major player creating illness for us? It was described in 2010 as a specific genus because we're starting to get genetics that can identify this thing. It was originally found... 50 years ago, 1968. Perkinsa species comes from oysters and other mollusks. These are nasty little bastards. Hydrus fatinus. <laughs> yeah. These are, these are from streams. Okay. And they're kind of like algae patterns. Spumella is, uh, these are uh, uh, very organized little early plant systems. Okay. And Saccharomyces used in winemaking, baking, brewing, and so on. Well, here's the problem, okay? We are faced with things like these infections and then toxoplasma that uh, Dr. Uh, Levy talked about as well. Uh, you know, these things are all around us in our environment. So the question is, why do we get tagged with them? Well, that's really the big question, and that's what I'm spending a lot of time looking at. Dr. Fry has just released a, a published report on chronic Fatigue syndrome. How many people know somebody with chronic fatigue? Oh, come on, raise your hands. You've got family members, I know that. And how come they don't get better? Because we don't know how to treat it. Why do we not know how to treat it? Because we don't know what causes it. And if you don't know what causes it, you don't know how to treat it, therefore the patient doesn't get better. And every one of the patients showed phenelliformis in that study. Everyone. And you go, wait a minute. Chronic fatigue syndrome could be a fungus? Yeah, deep blood fungus, not just a simple casual one. How about osteomyelitis showing, again, fungal patterns? Wait a minute, osteoarthritis, isn't that from overuse? Well, what about if your body can heal itself and adapt to overuse quite readily? As a matter of fact, a lot of people who come in with osteoarthritis have it in one knee, not the other. What's the distinction? I think it's because they've injured that knee in such a way the defense system and the repair systems can't work as well. They didn't hop around on one leg and overuse that one. They have something different about that leg. Rheumatoid arthritis and fungi. High levels of, as we talked about, antisaccharomyces. Uh, these are real live lab tests, folks. These are not just looking at rheumatoid tests. They're looking at infection markers. 
Chronic fatigue syndrome, microbial DNA, the, de the discovery of Perkinsis is particularly intriguing. Remember, Perkinsis is related to oysters and other mollusks that we eat. But the most frequently detected one is Phenelliformis, detected in 78% of the samples that uh, this particular report was several years ago. Next-gen testing is what it's called. It's sequential DNA testing. It holds the promise that infectious disease will be something we can understand because we can actually take snippets. Oh, guess where they're from? You're circulating blood. They're drawing blood samples and running them through genetic testing and finding markers for specific fungal and other eukaryotic infections. In other words, we're able to document that your bloodstream is showing fungal and other infections. Now, of course, the way we're taught in school is that you can't have circulating bacteria or fungus or whatever because that's called septicemia and you're going to die. So if you can't have it, and that's where we find it, maybe we're going to have to rethink things, that chronic disease might be a smoldering control of a fungal or similar infection in your blood because it's from other tissues, and that you finally succumb to that illness. And we call it that illness. We never look for an infectious disease cause for it, a deep blood fungus. The chronic fatigue patient here, I circled in red on the bottom, the potentially novel part. What they're doing is taking a genetic sip, SNP and then comparing it to the National Library of Medicine. They have this big, uh, you know, genetics library, and they go, oh, well, this is about 70% of the time. This one looks just like Phenelliformis, but 26% of it is not quite a good match. I think we're, we're looking at evolution. In, pro in progress. These things are making slight changes, slight changes, slight changes, and this one just happens to be more advanced than some of the others. It's very common to see 98, 99% of the genetics are tagged there. So, a common finding in the blood of chronically ill patients tested in the Fry Laboratory. It is a plant symbiote. It works great for the plants. It does not work great for us, and the bad news is it has a huge genetic mass, and it, it shows significant genetic diversity. In other words, this puppy can evolve. This puppy can change in regard to its environment. So as we make mistakes in taking care of patients, we might be actually creating the next generation fungus. This fungus was the only microbe detected in all three cases of coronary plaque a common finding in chronic fatigue syndrome and in some normal control patients. Okay, normal control patients showing positive findings. Who threw that little hook into the story there, okay? That's a red herring because are, are those patients getting sick and we just don't see it yet? Are, are those patients going to exhibit signs and symptoms of illness at some future point? Are those patients actually well along the way or maybe just a little bit along the way in terms of losing their immune system control over a fungal infection? We don't know. Those are the intriguing and fun questions because right now what we have is a qualitative test. Yes, we find it or no, we don't. Yes or no. We don't have a quantitative test where we find a whole bunch of it and then if we do treatment and we see it go down, all right, the quantitative test tells us that that treatment is winning. We don't have that yet, okay? We don't have that. We still have qualitative. But what's a qualitative test in normal patients? In my worldview, those patients should have their, how about vitamin C levels increased? How about looking at the other items in their nutritional background and taking care of that? So next generation sequencing has the potential to solve the mystery of chronic disease especially inflammatory disease. Because remember, ultimately all of these diseases are inflammatory diseases to some extent or another. Infection by definition is inflammation. Inflammation by definition is immunity. And I look at when patients come in, I see those three things as exactly the same. If I have inflammation, I'm looking for the infection. If I have immune problems, I'm looking for the inflammation and the infection. They're all the same. It's just the same ball of wax looked at from different angles. 
And when you look at it that way, you actually can treat patients very effectively. <clears throat> We've got a constellation of bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and algae that are attacking us. And now we can actually use a laboratory test to see it. We're talking cardiovascular disease, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, no longer funky weird, I don't know how to treat you, we'll have to do a zillion different things. Let's treat it as fungus. Osteoarthritis, autoimmune disease, gastritis. You know these people who go for 20 years, my gut has never been good. I have gut problems. I was just born that way, whatever the excuse is. Interstitial cystitis. You know, for years we've known that interstitial cystitis is an infection pattern, an inflammation pattern, an immune system pattern, and guess what? It can respond very nicely to antifungal treatment. The use of this sequencing in far more difficult and chronic cases might really allow clinical improvement. All right, well, let's talk about biofilms. Years ago, we had a wonderful whole day on biofilms at this meeting. And what we found was that, you know, biofilms are the explanation for people getting sick. Bad biofilms get sick people, and good biofilms get healthy people. And the contribution is the fact that these biofilms can harbor good or bad populations, not just of bacteria, but of viruses, fungi, protozoa, algae, fungus, and so on. In the blood samples from the patients with lupus, the DNA stains and cultures re revealed an unknown protozoan exhibiting a profound biofilm forming capability, and it was called Protomyxoa rheumatica. Big mistake. It wasn't. Okay. But we were looking at it in a biofilm. This was Dr. Fry's work about 10 years ago. Looking at it in a biofilm and struggled and finally were able to, to show some organisms of it. Called it a bacterium. And when you are able to get genetic testing on it, it's Vanilliformis mosii. It's a fungus. But don't blame Dr. Fry because PCP pneumonia, pneumocystis carinii pneumonia, which is common in AIDS patients, for years was treated as a bacterium. Guess what's a fungus? So now that we're getting deeper probes into the nucleic acids, we can actually look at what these things are, which gives us the opportunity to actually do some treatments. There's biological confusions, and with Phenelliformis mosii, uh, it's uh, starting to show us new worlds and vistas. Valley fever was thought to be a coccidia protozoan. It's fungal. Pneumocystis PCP pneumonia is fungal. So here's the new diagnostic approach. The biofilm matrix gives us significant hurdles for treatment until we really assess what's going on in the biofilm. In other words, when we really appreciate it's not just a collection of bacterial, that's not what your periodont periodontitis is, it is bacterial, fungal, protozoal, algae, and so on. Now we're starting to take a look at how the community of organisms makes us sick. DNA, eukaryotic DNA, not ours, but fungal and similar protozoan, MS patients, ALS patients, that DNA is in their biofilm. Is that the cause of their treatment or because of their illness are they now susceptible to the problem? And that's what they're showing us. How about carotid angioplasty? You know, they go in and they scrape out the carotid plaque that's blocking dense DNA staining material. In other words, it's not just a little bit infected, it's definitely infected. Chronic fatigue syndrome appears to have this infectious component, but we don't know if it's direct activity from the infection or it's immunologic failure, which then allows the phenelliformis to show more profound effects. We don't know, but we can tell you that polymicrobial infections in the oral flora accelerate inflammatory atherosclerosis. In other words, if you have periodontal disease, and dentists have known this for years, you have accelerated problems with your heart. You're going to show more an advanced and earlier heart blockage disease and other areas in your body as well. Invasion by microbes appears to favor other host challenges that influence plaque formation, such as 
altered lipid profile in the host. There's all this thing about, oh, we've got to give you statins and we've got to slam things around. Actually, what we have to do is treat the cause of what your body is doing to try and alter its blood fats. I'll give you an example. LDL, little, LDL cholesterol, which is what they want to slam down with statins, okay? They originally, they wanted to get it below 100. Now they're looking at below 75. But LDL is what's necessary for LP little a. LP little a is what you use when you don't have enough. Are you ready? Vitamin C. Vitamin C is the protectant to your endothelial linings, your blood vessel linings. And when you don't have enough vitamin C, you compensate for it by raising your cholesterol levels to get more LP little a which will go in kind of like a flex seal and help protect those arteries from getting atheroma or blockage disease. See, the story starts to kind of knit itself together. So statins uh, modify cardiovascular risk maybe by antimicrobial activity. It turns out that statins are antifungal. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Statins? Antifungal? Yeah, and the more effective the statin, the, the more better that it lowers your total cholesterols, the more effective it is as an antifungal drug. So it might be that the actual improvement that is claimed with statins, and there's a lot of issues with that, but that actual improvement may be because it's controlling deep blood fungus, or at least forestalling the effects showing. <clears throat> How about MS patients? Intravascular abnormalities. How many people know about these abnormalities in MS? In Italy, they learned that they could take a catheter, like you do for balloon angioplasty, and run it up to the base of the brain through the veins and blow up this gummy substance that they ran into and then deflate the balloon and come out. And MS patients could show improvement from weeks to months and then needed to have it repeated. Now, it's a very dangerous procedure. There's less than half a dozen centers in the United States that will continue to do that. But wait a minute. Well, well, let's go back for a second. What is the gummy material? What's the gummy material? I personally think that's the biofilm. And that biofilm just in mechanically in that area can readily grow and obstruct brain drainage, okay, blood vessel drainage. And indeed, if we treat those patients for deep blood fungus, we should expect to see improvements and not have to worry about doing the mechanical treatment. Phenelliformis mosii is among the most ecologically and economically important species in that group. It's natural in a wide range of habitats and climates. Does this sound like we're not able to escape this one? It has the, among the largest mitochondrial DNAs in the fungal kingdom, and it is really very adaptable. All right, microbes in treatments. Although there might be an absence of a clear mechanism of action, when we do treatment for SLE, lupus, okay, chloroquine, hydrochloride, an anti-malarial drug, other anti-malarial treatments like quinine derivatives, doxycycline, minocycline, been shown to be effective in MS. But, you know, MS is just a neurologic disease. What are we doing using these anti eukaryotic drugs? Well, because I think what we're dealing with is fungal and other protozoal infections. Antimicrobial therapies are not curative in these diseases. It may be that we're slowing the progressive and that these, these, these diseases will continue to progress but at a different rate, but I'm going to address that at the end of the talk. The dysfunction in the immune system in the patient might be the most important thing because we don't understand whether we're dealing with the chicken or the egg. We're definitely seeing phenyliformis and other eukaryocytes in the DNA sampling from the bloodstream, so we know it's in there. But the question is, why and how much is its contribution? So when you take into account all these findings, it looks like a definitely multifactorial process. It's unrecognized polymicrobial. You know, you do the culture and you want to see what does the culture show? Well, it showed this one. Okay, but that's just one of the very many likely present, and we have to understand clinical laboratory limitations in terms of identifying bacterial and other infections. I was a lab technologist before I went to medical school, and I'll tell you, 
it's a struggle in the back tea lab to get some of these things to grow up and show what you really want to see. You might not get enough of it. But now we know that we've got targeted protozoa in atherosclerosis. In other words, heart disease, which is the number one killer. Previous reports had just indicated aberrant eukaryocytic cells. No, they're, they're probably the primary ones. A complex biofilm community having bacteria and protozoa in the developing arteriosclerotic plaque. Now, these results may be consistent with a complex community of bacteria and protozoa that are developing... Oh, wait a minute. Excuse me. These are from root canals. Blanche Gruby provided these as their primary ones that they're seeing. Does it look to you like there's a whole range of bacteria that we're looking at, and they have not really yet tooled up to start looking for fungus, but that's coming. Fungus, protozoa, these things are what are killing us. Remember what I said, we die from two things, injuries and infections. And I'm dealing with the infection one now, and the infections create injuries inside, like atherosclerotic plaque that blocks your heart, you know, blood flow, that's an injury, but that's due to the infection. So we propose the following scenario here, polymicrobial biofilm infections. The initial insult, you get, you know, something going and it incubates, and then in the majority of individuals, they kind of keep things under control, which is why we survive long enough to raise kids and then uh, vote right or wrong and whatever. But it may be that, you know, these bastards are protected from the immune and inflammatory responses by a whole variety of chemicals floating around, probably pro-inflammatory ones. And that's what allows that biofilm scaffold to become so effective. In periods of emotional stress, illness, trauma, dietary excess, these communities may resurge, create problems, and that's significant because cracks in the biofilm could also expose these organisms to the immune system and might be part of what seems to be an immune system response against these things. So in other words, well, we're still back to the chicken and the egg thing but it may explain the relapsing and remitting nature of multiple sclerosis. Maybe it's just the infection waxing and waning or our response to it. Now, it's well known that biofilm-dwelling bacteria play a significant role in human disease. We know that already. But protozoal infections may be at the heart of a variety of these chronic human diseases, the puzzling, devastating, unusual ones. And, you know, we're also talking about aquatic-based protozoa, in other words, one from the water supply and such. Now, <clears throat> the Fry Lab and others have said they hypothesize that these protozoa may represent a non-trivial component in human disease, and the human vascular system may be where they actually colonize, which is why we would then see blockage disease coming, and that is a previously unrecognized vascular polymicrobial biofilm phenomenon. In other words, wait a minute. Biofilm inside the arteries? Well, yeah, that could be, huh? Because that would explain why we're seeing these DNA samples and the plaques and such that are being removed at surgery. That could either trigger or potentiate or contribute to vascular and immunological dysfunction. And remember who we're talking about. We're talking about vascular and immunological dysfunction in patients who are vitamin C deficient. Why can we make that claim? Because we're all vitamin C deficient. So in other words, we lack some of the things that would otherwise help to protect us. Now, prokaryocytes are not consistently observed in atheroma debris or filter samples, but you can detect these in filters that, you know, vascular filters that are removed by people. And wait a minute, that suggests they may be playing a role we don't really understand. And again, we're talking about the inflammation process and molecular studies have shown that periodontal disease periodontal disease. Remember we talked about one of the early routes of in ingestion here? And the associated bacteria and dental plaque have now been linked to arterial disease in addition to the understanding of chlamydia, which was 40 years ago. Protozoa include hundreds of thousands of diverse organisms, hundreds of thousands, and many of these play critical roles in cardiac and blood-borne diseases. Fungi have been previously detected in our atherosclerotic plaque and may actually be major players we just haven't appreciated. How about 26% of the blood samples showed prokaryotic traces? 
but 100% of the filter samples did. And you start saying, wait a minute, that means that we're just missing it a lot of the time. Yes, and this is what I love about doctors. Well, the test didn't show it. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm hoping you got the right test and the right lab did it and you understand how to interpret it because the test didn't show it doesn't mean much if the patient dies because they don't get the proper treatment. It doesn't mean much. So, uh, let's see. Here's one that was previously unreported. P. Guaguati, a known metazoan. That's a very ex um, expensive protozoan. This organism, like others, have not been previously reported, detected in human samples. It's an interesting observation now that we're seeing these things by DNA sequencing. So involvement of the eukaryotic organisms in the cardiovascular system is now really just at the beginning. You're going to see more and more understanding of this if you look for it. So fungal, nematode, cesto, trematode, those are worm infections, also known to be responsible for myocarditis, that's heart muscle inflammation, and vasculitis, that's blood vessel inflammation. In other words, how we get sick in our heart and blood vessel system. Inflammation plays a central role, and that raises the possibility that infections may trigger or be the source of chronic inflammation, or certainly are worsening it when it's present. These organisms may be responsible for atherosclerosis. They are enriched in atherosclerotic plaque. They are not found just in the peripheral blood. They are located, concentrated in the arterial walls. Here's a leukemia patient. Pat comes in. She has chronic neutrophilic leukemia, greater than 50,000 white cells. Now, interestingly enough, she was completely normal until they were uh, working on a house. This is over in Europe. And they were tearing out interior walls and everything. Well, you know, older houses in Europe could be made of stone, and stone doesn't breathe, and indeed, it, it just weeps in the humidity and stuff. And the workman called her over and said, hey, look at this. this the, it was solid fungal growth on the inside of the stone walls when they got the, the wall boards off. She wasn't sick until just after that. Fascinating, okay? Who would think that doing your house would get you in trouble? We did antifungal, antiparasitic treatment on her, reduced her counts to 19,000. She's had a lifelong history of hives. I think of hives, hives as a chronic activation of your complement system, the very primitive part of your immune system. She had thyroid goiter and rheumatoid factor and such. These are interesting in patients that we don't have good explanations for, like leukemia. How about Sissy with skin lesions? Her horse developed, horses developed lesions than she did. Dermatologists were stumped. The animal pathologists were uninterested. One of the horses died. Now, that, that should get your attention right off. Wait a minute. She and the horses look like they have the same kind of illness issue going on. One of them died. Well, it's taken us literally years, and she is almost completely better. It is fantastic to see what nobody else was fixing. How about Cindy? She came back from the Middle East and developed the these severe dermatitis. And, and indeed, she, she was accused of picking her skin off as these lesions and was diagnosed as severe delusional parasitosis at the best clinics in the country. Well, you know, remember what I said. If you don't diagnose it, you don't treat it. You don't treat it, it don't get better. So we treated her antifungal, antiparasitic, and she got dramatically better. She's all done. Bile duct cancer patient, Glenda, she was proposed for chemotherapy, severely symptomatic. I mean, literally, they told her, you are dying. And she came in. We have a lot of questions we ask when someone comes in, and she was all eights, nines, and tens on all her symptoms. And within six weeks, she was twos and threes, or ones, or zeros, with antifungal treatment. She has maintained her improvements over a year and a half. Prostate patient, Jim. Prostate biopsy, high-grade intraepithelial cancer. PSA level uh, 8.6 and then all the way down to 8. And it just lingers there. And the urologists say, well, we don't find any evidence of cancer. Indeed, his PCA3 test was normal five years ago. How about altered immunity patient, Kelso. Chronic neutropenia, white cell count. One and a half to three, three on a good day. Lymphopenia, basophilia. You know, she's got lead shot in her left thigh. Well, you know, the things happen. <laughs> and, and 
And she had a remote history of lichen planus, which we, we fixed years ago. But the thing is, is that she's maintained an intense, you know, uh, nutritional support program as well as antifungal, and she just does, can, she doesn't get sick, even though you think she should. How about Liz as a multiple cancers patient, pelvic cancer in 2001, lung cancer in 2003. She had massive recalcitrant edema. I mean big edema on her legs. We tried every which way but loose to deal with. Guess what started making it better? The treatment for antifungal and antiparasite. Her platelets are still over 500,000. Her lymphocytes are less than 800. And here's the problem. I can get lots of these patients clinically better Budging their blood tests is hard. That's an interesting thing. That means there's some piece of the puzzle I don't quite yet understand. Changes in the composition of these biofilms are associated with oral diseases, dental caries, cavities, periodontitis, and there are many varied interactions by all these species. So there's no one simple, oh, tell me what I need to do. What you need to do is to treat individual patients as individual patients, just like you do with regard to their dental needs for their teeth. Okay, they are all different and they will all respond differently and that's an important understanding. Pathogenic species are the periodontal microbiota. Now, I'm real strong on this. You know, we have different microbiomes, but I think the one in the mouth is the one that starts getting us in trouble. And then the one in the gut just joins in after we give antibiotics and screw everything up. And moving the microbiomes around is tough. It is not easy. It takes time. The oral microbiota represent an important part of the human microbiota, and they include several thousand, hundreds to thousands of species. So, you know, we're just scratching the surface and understanding this. But the gold standard is preventing caries and gingivitis and periodontitis, periodontitis and that's removing that biofilm. That's why brushing and flossing are important. The most recent classification of periodontal diseases acknowledges the clinical expression of plaque-induced gingival inflammation, substantially modified by systemic factors. In other words, anti-inflammation approaches, vitamin C, nutritional support. Metabolic, environmental, and systemic factors have a direct impact on the pathway of plaque-induced gingivitis. In other words, telling your patients to eat right is important as a stratagem. Invasive fungal infections are a significant health problem in immunocompromised patients, but what we've learned today with Dr. Levy aren't most of our patients, most of us, immunocompromised if we have low levels of vitamin C. Aren't we flirting with scurvy because it turns out, you know, that the, the lining in the endothelium, the, the blood vessels, is repaired when it's damaged by vitamin C. And so when it's not repaired, that's scurvy inside the blood vessels. So we are, in that sense, immunocompromised. Fungal infection is difficult to treat because antifungal therapy is still controversial. That's by the doctors who don't understand it. It's still based on clinical grounds. Yes, it's called getting the patient better. Drug dose and treatment outcome, those are difficult issues. All right, the incidence of fungal infections is considered a serious public health issue worldwide, but not necessarily here. So, take a lead from us? No, I think not. Fungal resistance is a real serious issue, and we're struggling with that. In our part of the world, this is in Denmark, invasive fungal infections include invasive yeast infections with candida. That's the most common, simple yeast, okay? And that is the dominating pathogen literally around the world. Aspergillus, there's mold and yeast and barrier leakage and immune function. And the, basically, you start getting sick with fungus or mold or yeast, or mildew, people can, then you actually are on your way out. We just haven't found the disease process that's going to take you. Molds are ubiquitous in nature and the environment, and we inhale their spores constantly. So invasive mold infections typically come from the airways. And you know what the problem is? They don't just stay in the lungs. They can disseminate through the bloodstream. There are remarkable differences in virulence according to the different candida species, yeast species. But you know what? <laughs> it's kind of like you want to get dead from a 50 millimeter howitzer or a 22. Kind of doesn't matter if you're still dead. Okay? So don't worry about how pathogenic a particular organism. Worry about what kind of result it is having for you. 
Now, recently there's a correlation between fungal infection and MS in the peripheral blood of patients. And you know what? It's also in the cerebral spinal fluid, which would suggest maybe that's the more aggressive forms of MS. Antibodies reacting against several candida yeast species being found in these patients in the CSF. Wow, maybe all these illnesses really are fungal. Overall, these findings support the notion that fungal infection can be demonstrated and may constitute a risk factor. I the the, love the way the doctors say it. Even though it looks like we might really have an answer, we're going to ignore it because, well, more studies would be needed. And by the time those studies are completed, you and I will be dead. From what? From those diseases that they could have treated for us. But, you know, you can't be too careful. You know, they say, when, you, when your first day of medical school happened for me, first do no harm. That's what the dean says, right? First do no harm. And then we proceed to harm, harm, harm. Uh, maybe we didn't get the message that first day. Astaxanthin, just as an example of an anti-inflammatory, one of the strongest antioxidants in nature. It's neuroprotective, it's anti-inflammatory, anti-apoptotic. These are health inducing changes from this nutrition. Well, it's naturally occurring red carotenoid, okay, and it exerts preventive actions against atherosclerosis, cardiovascular disease, oxidative stress, inflammation, lipid metabolism, glucose metabolism. Did Dr. Levy talk about any of these things? Yes. All right, so let's talk about our muscular mycorrhizal fungi. That's the Phenelloformis, okay? The Phenelloformis has genetical divergence that may occur over 20 years in its population, in its limited area. In other words, you can take these species, look for them, and watch them over a period of time, and they actually evolve where they are. What's this door? This door is your front door, okay? As long as you stay inside your house, you can be safe. The moment you open that front door, you have opened yourself to illness. Why? Because of all the environmental toxins, the air, the water, the food. It's hard to get good food on the, on the road, okay? And I mean on the road when you're just driving around town, not just when you're driving somewhere else. And we are constantly being exposed to all these people with their infections and sharing with us and such. Thank God we don't kiss everybody whose mouth looks like this. But if we did, and people do, you've got to wonder about that, but anyway... Um, this is certainly a source of where you're going to get sick in the future. People have these things going on inside. Oh, yeah, I got a tooth, but it stopped hurting, and I do need to go get it tended to. Yeah, I kind of think you do. But that kind of tooth can create the, the marked infection and other illness changes that we spend a fortune on in our medical care system because something this simple didn't get attended to or something this complex or that complex or as complex as these. These are starting to get to be nasty, invasive, mold-related diseases, okay? Now, who gets to see these first? The dentist. Why? Because you're the first line of defense against all these infections that are going to take us down. And if you pay attention to it and make those proper referrals, get them started on the road, they can actually survive and don't have to have all of the continuing changes in the oropharyngeal cavity. Candida infections are the most prevalent opportunist fungal infections. Biofilms are antifungal resistant. In other words, it's kind of a thick, think of it like this, painting rubber cement over a surface, and then all the things want to grow in the rubber cement. Don't try to kill your biofilm. Try to replace the organisms growing in it. That's an important phenomenon because it is protective when all the good things are growing in it. So <clears throat> resveratrol showed an anti-biofilm effect, inhibiting the formation and eradicating the mature biofilm with the bad bugs in it. Wait a minute, resveratrol, we just, we just, we just talked about with Dr. Levy as an anti-inflammatory. So do you see how the picture keeps coming together? Here's sources of resveratrol. They're colored. Okay, why? Because it's, it's, it's bioflavonoids, and those are the colors in plants. And those are phenolic compounds that are in various plant species because that is their defense against, are you ready, fungus. So they're preparing their own defense, and we can take advantage of it 
Stilbenoids exert various biological activities. They are all anti-inflammatory. Resveratrol is one of the major ones, okay? And it's just antioxidant. It shows positive health effects against cancer and heart disease, neurodegenerative diseases, diabetes and such. Can you see how the picture keeps coming around? Here's a funny one, terminally a chibula tree used for anti-diabetic, mutagenic, oxidant, bacterial, fungal, viral effects. Dental plaque bacteria are intimately associated with gingivitis and periodontitis, and they are reduced by this particular fruit. And it also prevents bone resorption, an interesting little deal. That's what the tree looks like. That's what the fruit looks like. I've never encountered one. Oh, well. How about people with bad breathing disorders, okay? You ever seen anybody with status asthmaticus? That's where they've got a bad asthma attack and we can't stop it. That will make you believe you're going to die. Well, status asthmaticus, they try to use cortisone and bronchodilators and oxygen and chest tubes and anesthesia sometimes and antibiotics. Does it sound like we are not winning games like that? Well, guess what? Fungal exposure is a major risk factor for developing asthma. Fungal exposure, a major risk factor. And so Canada albicans remains one of the ones to readily induce asthma. And this might represent a fungal infection process, this asthma treatment. Just think of it when you're watching all the advertisements for asthma and COPD on the TV. Mucormycosis infections, these are life-threatening. They occur with all the variety of risk factors we know about. But the interesting thing is tr treatment really requires correction of the underlying risk factors. In other words, it's not just, oh, we've got to treat that. We've got to treat the risk factors that allow you to stumble into that. That's going to be deadly. That's not fun. How about this? This is turmeric, curcumin. Turns out curcumin is effective against bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites. It apparently reduces the ergosterol in the cell wall of the fungus, and that results in the fungus getting sick and dying. Wait a minute, I'd rather the fungus die than I die. That seems like a good idea. Oral administration of curcumin is more effective than dexamethasone. Dexamethasone, that's strong cortisone in reducing the fungal burden in mice, okay? And the adhesion of Canada species is reduced. And that's in comparison to fluconazole, which is a pretty powerful antifungal medication. The synergistic activity of curcumin with the azole and polyene drugs, in other words, the ones we use as antifungal, shows a 10 to 35-fold reduction in the minimum inhibitory concentrations needed to effectively treat the fungal disease. In other words, you can use these things like curcumin to help make the drugs much more effective so you get shorter courses of treatment and better improvement. The mixture of curcumin and, are you ready, ascorbic acid, a 5 to 10-fold reduction in the minimum inhibitory concentrations needed. Curcumin in combination with different fungicide materials increases the efficacy of those antifungal strategies. You know, the most significant effect was found against candida species, and that's the major one around the planet for the yeast syndrome. It's not for deep blood fungus, but it might be that's what predisposes people to get the deep blood fungus. Here's just an example showing on the yeast cell that the different drugs work in different levels so that, you know, I try to combine them to get this and that so that I can use lower dosages on these things. But increased drug resistance from fungi cannot be avoided. And those biofilms, we're back to that because that can make things tricky in terms of delivering the drug to it. Antifungal substances derived from plants can selectively act on different targets with fewer side effects. We're talking, you've heard about them garlic and oregano, podarco, cloves, walnut, olive oil, tea tree oil, golden seal, calendula, spearmint, neem. These are things that we've talked about, but it turns out there is a very good intellectual basis for using these things. Phenolic acids, flavonoids, tannins, and stuff like that, these are the polyphenols. Dr. Levy was talking about the importance of these as anti-cancer, anti-hypertensive, anti-allergen, inflammatory, oxidant, and antimicrobial. You know, this is called food, 
if we eat it right and if we take the right supplementation, especially if we're sick if we do those. Essential oils also have shown dramatic effects. This is one of the reasons people who've been sick and say, oh, I found this, this brand of wonderful oils and now I'm getting better, because they actually do have antifungal effects. And terpenoids in those oils may be useful as future antifungal chemotherapeutic agents, not just for cancers, but for infections. And, you know, the thing is, is that the advantages of combining these therapies includes lower dosages of antifungal agents with synergistic activities, the development of less drug resistance. Remember, these plants have developed these particular ways of avoiding fungal decay. In other words, you know, being eaten by the fungus. That's what it's trying to do. And these have lasted for a lot of years. If we use them properly, we can probably reduce the drugs that we, we tend to rely on in order to get treatment. Here's a fun example. This is a plant that's a meat eater. This is carnivora, okay, the, the Venus flytrap. And indeed, the carnivora extracts that are used, uh, they actually appear to have a major antifungal effect for plant and fungal pathogens. Uh, that's interesting because that just sort of opens a whole new world of how we might take care of problems. Uh, what kind of problems? We've got to stop putting all this mercury in. We've got to properly take it out when we find it. Because when you grow candida in your gut, there's examples here, guess what? That increases the level of organic mercury from the mercury that you swallow and inhale because of those fillings in your mouth. So now we've got a way to increase our poisoning by having the candida fungus yeast growing in our gut at the same time we've got all of those fillings. Good reason to get them out. And don't forget our GMO system, because that's certainly keeping us healthier, isn't it? And all these people who are walking through the fields, what are they spraying? Oh, stuff to make the food grow better. Why can't they just spray it? Why do they have to be in hazmat while they spray it? Because it'll be safe for you when the food finally gets to your table. I'm sure you can believe that. And these just show the concentrations of the various pesticides and things like that in the various neighbor neighborhoods. Corticosteroids, which you know we use for the confusing diseases, have lots of side effects, and any of those things can take you out. They literally can kill you, and that's why corticosteroids should not be widely used, except very carefully in combination in ways that help people. Here's examples of the injuries that chemotherapy causes, it's every organ in the body can be damaged by chemotherapy. So if you have a disease and they say, you know, the way we treat this is, uh, you know, with chemotherapy, okay, realize that's the first disease and you're going to show subsequent diseases because they're going to create them. And remember with puzzling diseases, there's only two things we use, chemotherapy and cortisone or cortisone and chemotherapy, you pick the order. That's what happens with those puzzling diseases that I listed in the beginning, such as rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, prostate cancer, leukemia, acquired immunocompromise, autoimmune diseases, heart attacks and strokes, and resistant bacterial infections, hospital-related fungal infections. That's about 100,000 Americans a year. They're often deadly. Community-acquired fungal infections, these numbers don't include all the other illness patients that are associated with fungal disease. And yet, what we're looking at is the casual way with which that etiology, the fungus causing the problem, is simply ignored. It's simply ignored. Well, if it's ignored, remember, what you don't treat, don't get better. What don't get better is what's going to kill you. And indeed, your doctor's choosing not to treat. When I was doing hospital work back in the old days, I would write, because I'd gotten a master's in nutrition, I knew a little bit about this, I would write nutritional orders and I would write antifungal orders for my patients and my consultants in the intensive care unit would come behind me and cancel them. Okay, and so then I would go behind them and reorder them and they would come behind me and recancel them. It's a quick way for me never to call you as a consultant again, okay? The other quick thing was for me to realize I ain't ever going to get people better in the ICU because you can't do what you want to do. I mean, vitamin C in the ICU, I mean, that's not going to happen. Maybe we're coming around, but maybe not. Anti-this or that drugs often have antifungal activity. There's a spelling error there. 
Rapamycin, it's a macrolide immunosuppressant used to treat coronary stents. In other words, when they put them in, they're trying to keep them from getting blocked and reduce organ transplant rejection, a long list of side effects, but it's also antifungal. Maybe that is really the key event. Maybe it's that it's antifungal. Remember, your immune system, first of all, it's the only one you got, okay? But your immune system is the critical piece of the puzzle. Damage to your immune system is what gets you sick. Failure to repair it is what keeps you ill and lets you die. It's your immune system. Think of the three amigos. Infection, inflammation, immunity, okay? It's all the same thing. They're the band of brothers, okay? And when you have infection, you have troubles with the other two. If you have inflammation, you have trouble with the other two. Immunity, troubles with the other two. So don't start looking because these things all interrelate. Each causes the next and is caused by and worsened by the next. But in medicine, we have uh, a very A to B kind of uh, treatment plan. You have A, we treat with B. You have C, we treat that with D. But for more effective medical care, you have A, which also means if we're looking for it, if we're thinking about it, then we start looking at risk factors and what else can come up. If you have A, you also have E and G and M, or perhaps even more. So we treat with all of the factors need to resolve the problem and create normal balance. Remember, we're dealing with infection, inflammation, and immunity. They're all the same thing. And everybody says that, you know, the two things that are always there in life are death and taxes. But I would say that there's three certainties, death and taxes and fungus. <laughs> now, how many people think there are possibly three things that are certain in life? Have I sold you on that yet? Death, taxes, fungus? Yeah. See your hand, let's see your show of hands. I, you got to persuade your friends. Okay, there you go. Okay. So a couple of you are still going to get sick, but that's okay. <laughs> You've got to put the pieces of the puzzle together. Okay. And until you do, and the bad news is, we depend on our doctors to do it. And the bad news is, if our doctors don't do it, people die. My dad died four years ago. He's 95. He was visiting in my house. He slipped, fell, ripped the skin off his arm, had to go to plastic surgery. He gets <clears throat> an aspiration pneumonia. He gets congestive failure. He gets all their fancy treatments and such. They will not put him on lenoxin heart medication that he'd been maintained on for 14 years for his mild failure pattern, always did well. They wouldn't do it, and I'd say, if you don't do it, he's going to go back into failure. So he would go back into failure, ambulance transfer back to the real hospital, okay, for control of his congestive failure with more intensive drugs, not, not lenoxin, okay, and he'd be on two fourth-generation antibiotics. And I go, what are the antibiotics for? Well, that's the protocol. Uh, but, but he doesn't have pneumonia. He has congestive failure. Yeah, but that's the protocol. Well, I got that, but no pneumonia, so why antibiotics? That's the protocol. It's like I'm talking to a proto-wall, okay, for their protocol. That's the way they're going to do it. Still no lenoxin. They would send him back to the skilled nursing, and that's a euphemism. And you know what a euphemism is? It's neither skilled nor nursing. Okay, good. And sure enough, they would not put him on lenox, and then guess what would happen? He go back into failure. We, we played this game three times. Why the two fourth generation antibiotics? At his age, that's the protocol. Were they making him sicker and sicker? Yes. Did they put the pieces of the puzzle together? No. Was I telling them the pieces of the puzzle that had worked for him for years, happily with his internist and his family doctor coordinating with me? No. So you can tell doctors about the pieces of the puzzle, and the problem is they're looking the other way. They don't care, and the faster you get out of their field of view, the better. Ah, got to tell you, things happen, explosive things happen when people are not treated right, okay? When the volcano explodes, it's not the time to figure out how to put the cork back in. It ain't going to happen. It's like domino diseases. You push one of the dominoes, and it just keeps going, 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 going. And that's how we die in this country. We die from progressive medical care. I would rather have regressive medical care. I think that's going to be better, and especially facing nutrition is one of the key things. Oh, maybe like vitamin C, that could be potentially helpful. Maybe resveratrol and so on. 
It's just like a cookie cutter system where those pretzels just keep rolling off the line. Nothing's going to stop them. They just keep coming. And that's the way the drugs are produced. And that's the way the drugs are sold. And that's the way people expect it. I went to the doctor. I got my prescription. Now I'm going to get better. They have no responsibility to get better because they have no understanding of the actual infections that are making them sick. And when they understand that, they become whole different patients, get better very quickly, and get a real life going on in their lives. Instead, they've got a tsunami. They've got a tsunami that's killing them. It's sometimes faster, sometimes slower, but when that wave catches you, you're done. The chances of reversing it are minimal. The chances of you going back to a placid sea and enjoying your life are pretty much over. Uh-oh. <clears throat> I misspoke myself. <laughs> that happens. People do. I kind of led you to the idea that it was just the fungus, but it isn't. It's the polymicrobial community. It's all those little bastards together, each making you sicker for the other to take advantage of you. And then recycling that system and recycling that system. And that's the progressive illness. And the fact that we stay al alive any time longer and the fact that we are actually doing well for any years, that's a tribute to the resilience of the human frame. You know, we kind of are in pretty good shape. I'm surprised we stay alive at all given the infectious assault that we get. And in actual fact, and, and I'm pretty sure I've discussed this with most of you guys, what I used to see when I started practice 40 years ago was people in their 70s, 80s were sick. And then it was people in their 60s and 70s. Then it was in their 50s and 60s. Then it was in their 40s and 50s. Then it was in their 30s and 40s. And now it's not uncommon to see very sick people in their 20s. And you go, what happened? Well, part of it is in 1940 we asked the question, can we poison the planet? Guess what? The answer is yes, we can. We, we figured out how to do that. That's not hard. And then what we did is we started getting away from the farms and went to agribusiness. So our nutrition dramatically changed. And then we started getting the government telling us how we ought to eat and making it easily available and such like that. So all the benefits of fresh water supplies and public hygiene have pretty much been reversed by our nutritional deficiencies and toxic exposures. Okay, so in any event, let's talk about the polymicrobial infections. Doxycycline plus terbenifidine or fluconazole or itraconazole, this can make actually a major difference in patients who are suffering. Or clarithromycin plus any of these above, or doxycycline and ivermectin. I mean, you hear what I'm saying is these are strange drugs, except for the doxy and the biaxin. So the, the key is, is that it's not complicated for a doctor who wants to learn how to take care of these infections. He may stumble, in which case he should refer to somebody who does know how to take care of them. But the deal is, is that we can get a start and actually reverse a lot of the changes that people have by fairly simple things. Now, you know, the Fry Lab started being able to do this test three years ago. And at that time, we used to use five, six, seven drugs, higher dosages, longer times. You ever try to keep a patient on an uncomfortable drug for a longer time? That's hard. That doesn't happen. And then you go, well, you know, you actually look pretty good. Maybe we didn't have to prescribe it for longer. And what has happened is the treatment programs are getting smaller. They're getting lower in dosage. They're getting shorter in time. And we're still getting really good results. That's kind of neat because these are the puzzling diseases for which there isn't any obvious treatment. These are the devastating diseases where people feel badly and don't get better. They have worms. They have parasites that are nasty. They, here's an example on classification of parasites. Protozoa, the amoeba and the ciliates and so on. Multicellular worms and stuff. And you go, worms? Yeah. Wait a minute. Why would we have worms in this country? <clears throat> Anybody ever go to the bathroom and see the little sign that says employees must wash their hands? They, they didn't know that? They, they, they have to be reminded? Okay, that's different. I do hope they wash their hands. But remember that a lot of the people who are serving our needs in food establishments and other places, you know the little green card that they don't have? 
okay? And they're just kind of flying under the radar, and they are bringing with them all of their health initiatives from overseas, which might not be much. In other words, while we had barriers to people coming in who were really sick, we have no barrier now, and they can bring their sickness with them. You know, we've got a resurgence of TB. We've got a resurgence of polio, smallpox. I mean, things that we eliminated, we now have in surges coming through because our population is being exposed to that, and that includes worms, okay? This is kind of fun. This is looking at a, a sequential thing on a, on a lab test, and you're going, well, you know what? The consensus is, and you go, wait a minute, the consensus. In other words, we're going to kind of average these things together, and we're going to kind of vote and say, this looks probably like what that is. That's not quite precise enough in my worldview, unless it doesn't matter every single one of these is going to be knocked out by the drug treatment that we're going to use, or the resveratrol and curcumin and so on. Unfortunately, I don't think we're at that level yet. But I wanted to show you there is still com some confusion and fudge factor because there is a medical knowledge gap, okay? We, the clinical information explosion is happening, and we're not keeping up with it. Um, you know, the idea that we, well, when I started medical school, they said that the, the amount of information will double every four years. Okay, so when I ended medical school, it was twice as much information. When I ended residency, it's twice that, so now it's four times as much information, and that was 40 years ago. So you can imagine I have just a little smidge of understanding of what's really able to be understood. So hopefully what we're going to get is computerized systems, AI and whatever, that can actually sift through all of this and start to make sense. But what's the problem with a computerized system? The bias of the programmer. Okay? It's the bias of our medical education. The professors say, this is how you do it, and that's how people do it forever because they would stop learning when they start practicing. It should be a license to learn, not a license to kill. But what comes down to it is the bias of the programming can keep us from ever seeing these kinds of issues, which is why the free exchange of information, like in meetings like this, is what can lead to continuing expansion of the knowledge of what really is effective treatment. Now remember, close counts and horseshoes, okay, hand grenades, and shotguns. So we don't really want to be close with our treatments. We want to be as precise as possible. It's hard to be as precise as possible when I did then what I knew how to do, and it's still what I do. Yeah, I know that's still what you do. You know, can, have you been to any continuing edu courses, education courses for physicians? Okay, I have. I don't like them, so I stopped going. I just go to the continuing education courses for integrative medicine physicians because they're actually learning and they're still on target with what's going on. They are advancing the field. They are making understanding of these strange illness situations possible. And treatment then can proceed. Remember, you don't know about something, you don't look for it. If you dismiss the idea, you don't look for it. If you don't think it's relevant in this patient, you don't look for it. If you do, don't test for it, you don't find it. If you don't find it, you don't treatment, treat it. If you don't treat it, the patient stays sick. If that's what the problem is. But when you're faced with the idea, I don't know what the problem is, it's RA, it's uh, systemic lupus, it's uh, MS, it's ALS, it's, it's, you know, blah, blah, blah. You just go ahead and pick it, osteoarthritis. Wait a minute, arthritis? Don't you just use an anti-inflammatory? Yes, if you want to kill someone, okay? Oh, that, I don't say that facetiously. That's how I got into integrative medicine. In my first year in practice, a fellow comes in in his early 50s, and I prescribed naproxen, a relatively new drug he had not had. And he thought I walked on water because he could. He was suddenly pain-free and did great until I was called to the intensive care unit where he bled to death in front of me from an ulceration in his gut caused by naproxen that I prescribed. So this first do no harm, mm, that can weigh heavily on you at that point. And that's how I ended up into integrated medicine because I was not ever going to do that kind of crap again. Incidentally, it's still available. It's much safer now. They call it a leave. So just take two leaves, you got the same dose I gave him. So I did then what I knew how to do, but then my job is to learn to do things different. What if you're right and they're wrong? 
This is the problem that integrative medicine doctors, integrative dental doctors face, is you're dealing with a board that's swimming that way, and you're swimming this way, because you have figured out how to do it in a way that it works better for patients. It works healthier for patients. They're not willing to tolerate that very much because, well, they're right. No, what if you're right and they're wrong? We have a big uphill climb on this. But remember, knowledge is power. Knowing how to do it does make a difference because you can actually hit the bullseye. You can actually take very sick patients and make them very much better. You know, it is a big jump and there's a lot of risks in between there, okay? And the risk that we face with our patients is really quite simple. They can die. They can die from the kinds of illnesses that we fail to treat well enough. But they can also die from the kinds of illnesses they are creating called lifestyle illnesses. But you know what? They're one and the same because those lifestyle illnesses are taking them to the level of fungal illness and pushing them over the edge. And that's exactly what every single one of the lifestyle changes does, which is why it's so much prevalent in our society now. Experience is a hard teacher because she gives the test first and the lesson afterwards. So here's the take-home lesson. Injuries, infections. Now we think of infections as bacterial, viral, parasitic. We need to start thinking of them as fungal. Injuries, infections, and remember those infections are fungal. So here's what you want to do is share that information. Share that to people who say, oh, I could see that. That would make sense. Have them start actually getting information and learning about fungal illness. It is a bright idea. Okay? It's a great idea. But you've got to walk through the door. And every time you walk outside your own door, you're in hazardous territory, whether it's the intellectual door you're walking out of or the house where you, know, you have your own food and environmental control and so on. What are the things you can do if you think fungal disease is important to control? Here's one. Brush your teeth. Remember that biofilm? We have to disrupt that biofilm so that it can actually get healthier. Mechanical disruption of that biofilm makes a huge difference. How much? Huge difference. Okay. Why did Weston Price find that people who you know, were in the deepest dark Africa or wherever else and didn't brush their teeth, why did they have such great dentition? Because they chewed on roots and stems and stuff. They were effectively brushing their teeth with their nutritional products, which also were loaded with polyphenols, bioflavonoids, and so on. In other words, they were keeping their biofilms healthy which we didn't know. You know, uh, I, well, I belabor the point, but we don't do what we need to do to take care of ourselves because there's got to be a pill for it. Instead, there's actually a soap for it. I would suggest that you wash your mouth out with soap because that'll keep you honest. Remember when we were kids and that was the threat? Happily for a lot of us, they didn't actually do it very often. But tooth soap is magic. I had inflammatory periodontal disease for virtually 60 years of my life. There were areas I could not brush because it was exciting electric pain, okay? And it's just, it was continuous and it didn't matter, Sensodyne or whatever else, it kept happening. And one of my patients said to me as, as I was talking with him, he says, Doc, have you ever tried brushing your teeth with soap? I had the same reaction you do when I say it. Oh, not so. He got me a paper on it. I gave it to my dentist. He said, oh, I don't see any reason not to. Ivory soap is 99 and 44, 100 percent pure. I figured that's pretty good, okay? So I started rubbing my toothbrush on and brushing with the ivory soap, and in 30 days, my periodontal gingival changes were gone. My salsi went from six and eights down to twos and threes and an occasional four. That's pretty impressive because I can actually brush all the areas of my mouth now. I found out about tooth soap, a little bit easier than the ivory, and I have to tell you that when I have patients come in with periodontal disease, I say, do you want me to make it better? Well, I'm seeing this doctor. I'm going to get operation. I said, yeah, but before your operation, would you like for it to get better? And I get, have them get a Sonicare toothbrush or any of the other mechanical ones like that, get the tooth soap, and then there's other little mechanical things you can do. But those are the two critical pieces of information. Flossing would be a good idea because there's another area on the, on the tooth to take care of. 
And you can even do the flossing with uh, water floss. It's a, a different approach, but mechanically can help. What about different solutions you can rinse your mouth with? Well, there's pros and cons on all of those and such. I think that basically we're going to find there will be a developed one that we will all agree is probably among the best. Periodine, which I understand is no longer going to be available, or at least not in its present form, it's essential oils. And I've had patients chew on those after they do their you know, soap brushing and stuff and get dramatically better on their gums and then find that they're in good shape. How about drinking them water? It's a good idea. Sure beats Coke. Well, not that I'm partial against Coke. It also beats Dr. Pepper and 7-Up and a few others, okay? How about real fresh vegetables? You'll notice the colors. Remember the colors because that's your bioflavonoids. That's your polyphenols. That's your natural protection against inflammation and infection. How about enough meats? You know, it's real frustrating. People don't eat enough meats. Well, they eat their fried chicken, but that doesn't actually really kind of qualify as the meats that we're supposed to get, and they should be taking their supplements. How many? Well, it depends on what we're treating. If we're just maintaining good health, it's not a whole bunch. If we're actually trying to reverse the disease and we want to do it before a few years have gone by, it can be many. How about probiotics? That's a good idea because your microbiome, you know, the, the, we're learning so much now about the bacteriology. We have an oral microbiome, we have a sinus microbiome, we have a lung microbiome, we have a gut microbiome. They now have shown kidney and bladder microbiome, okay? But every one of those areas has a fungibiome. In other words, different yeasts and, and uh, uh, mold and fungus and whatever growing in those zones, generally under good control when you're in good health. But that's a biome that has received virtually no attention. And I think if we're lucky, if we get the good replacement of a microbiome, that it'll take care of itself in a lot of cases. But I got to tell you, it takes months to budge a microbiome. It's not just like, okay, you know, take this bottle and you'll be just fine. That was an idea I gave up a long time ago. How about sit down supper? I don't know. I don't have time. Do you? Uh, you don't have time, do you? Marvin's, no, he's got a rush, so we can't have a sit down. But the thing is, is that what we've done is we've changed our lifestyle to where we just induce stress and we fail to put calming times in in family enjoyment and so on. We're so busy running helter-skelter, but really that can make a huge difference, especially if you're doing your sit-down meals at home. George Washington, fairly wealthy guy. I mean, he had a plantation, he had lots of you know, different industries and so on. He brought out the sugar at their dinner table when they had guests. Sugar was expensive. I mean, they made it too there at the plantation. That was expensive. They didn't just have that willy-nilly like we do. And we can have sugar six different times a day. And that's part of our problem with the microbiome. You know, the Meguiar's sugar said it best. Sugar time, sugar time, sugar time. But what we have to remember is bad, bad, bad sugar. Sugar bad, okay? Smoking, bad, okay? Toxic metals, bad. We need to use chelation to get rid of them. You can't avoid getting the toxic metals in. I can guarantee you that. They're all over the environment. You're getting them in, okay? The older you are, the more concentrated you have of the lead and such like that. But the deal is, is we can get them out. So it takes dozens of years to get them in and a few dozen treatments to really remove enough of them that they get out of the way and stop damaging your defense system and allowing the inflammation, because they're pro-oxidant, allowing the inflammation to go wild. <sighs> I hate putting this one up. <laughs> all right, good, I'll skip it. And avoid chemicals. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Avoid chemicals and additives. And, you know, if you have to read the label on, on your food, uh-oh, okay, because that, that's trouble, especially when you encounter words you can't pronounce. But don't worry, they're just emulsifiers and uh, fires and iron fires and running and stuff. And I just think of them creating fires on the inside. Avoid drugs wherever possible. You know, you go to the doctor, and, and a lot of times I'll write an antibiotic for a patient for their throat infection or their bladder or whatever, and I'll say, don't fill it. Let's try these other strategies first. If it just all gets better in the next day or two, don't worry about it. But you don't have to call me. You can go ahead and fill it if you feel like it. That's a great way to do it because if the patient gets better with conservative strategies, you don't have to do something. Get some exercise. It's a good idea. Walking is the simplest. 
Walking makes sense. Walking just does everything. Besides that, when you walk, you see the outside world, and that's beautiful. Get enough sleep. Get enough restful sleep. We have a hard time doing that, but I'll tell you, it sure do make you feel better, okay? Oxygen. I started studying oxygen levels in 1993 because of congestive heart failure. And it turns out you don't have to have CHF. You can have a whole series of other illnesses, heart disease, strokes, arthritis, cancer, whatever, and you often have lower oxygen levels at the levels that the doctors think are okay. Well, your oxygen level is down at 93. Yeah, but 99 and 100 are normal. 98 is borderline. 97 is abnormal. 88 is Medicare oxygen for life. So they'll let you get down there before you can do oxygen. And Medicare has now made it impossible. They don't want to pay for oxygen, period. And I'll let you guess why. Good guess. Oropharyngeal constriction here. You know, this is Felix Lau's um, slide, thank you. And it's also an example of how a constricted airway can be so misdiagnosed. Because what they want to do is put everybody on the scuba dive, you know, CPAP. Or if you're lucky, they actually use BiPAP, which is a whole lot safer. I mean, I think that they're dangerous for your lungs anyway. But the deal is, is that if you simply readjust the three-foot cage, as Felix says, your mouth has a six-foot tiger, your tongue, in a three-foot cage. If you simply rearrange that by proper appliances and positioning, you can open that airway and you no longer have a restrictive pattern. Now, you may still have a central pattern, that's the oxygen deficiency. So you've got to look at all the dynamics, and I can guarantee you the doctors don't. How about reducing stress? That'd be a great idea. One of my friends, Pelletier, wrote a book called Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. Subtitle, It's All Small Stuff. And when you look at it like that, remember, they don't take you out back behind the barn and kill you. You know, it may be uncomfortable and whatever, but life goes on, just learn to... Learn to live with it. Learn to just kind of go with the flow, you know? I like that song, if you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with. <laughs> Classes of antifungal drugs, they are available. There's about 30 different drugs we can use to treat the deep blood fungus pattern. So there's a clinical art involved, okay? <clears throat> I think we're getting closer to understanding things. And the nice news is, is that as we really do, we're going to have shorter, simpler treatment programs. anti nematode these are ones that can be used against worms and such. But if you'll notice, the azoles are in this category. Those azoles are classically antifungal. And then here's protozoan, anti-malarial, and anti helminth and, anti and stuff. And when you start going across, you start realizing, wait a minute, those all look kind of like similar drugs. Yes. So the idea is that if we've got a polymicrobial community, if we have several different organisms involved and we select them correctly, we'll probably be able to bring everything down to enough of a level. Now, you've got to remember that bringing things down, I don't think in terms of eradication. I was hopeful in the beginning. I think all we're going to do is bring the deep blood fungus down to a level where it's not interfering anymore. Okay? And that's really the key is just get it to where it's out of the way and we can lead our lives a whole lot more healthy, a whole lot more comfortable, okay? And that's why I think we see it when we find it in, quote, normal people, is they still have it under control enough, they are developing disease, okay? And we don't yet have that quantitative test to where we can really see where are they along that progression. But as we start looking at our patients for nutritional and toxic evaluations, fungal evaluations, will begin to lose, uh, use the correct adjustments on those antifungal drugs and really make a difference. Ozone. Yeah, I think that has a real place in this. Ozone, vitamin C, these things are working similarly. Specific nutritionals with an anti-infection and anti-inflammation property. And I got news for you, they're often the same exact thing. Why? Infection, inflammation, immunity. They're all the same thing. Specific nutraceuticals with immune-stimulating and organ support properties. Again, they're all the same thing. Mycotoxins are dangerous. Mycotoxins come from big, bad mold and fungus, okay? The saga begins all over again. Canada Auris is an emerging multi-drug-resistant yeast. Yeast, for God's sake, not just uh, mold or fungus. 
causes serious invasive infections discovered not 10 years ago. It's resistant to multiple classes of antifungals. It's misidentified usually as other yeasts. Remember I said the clinical laboratory has a hard time figuring these out. And the ability to colonize patients perhaps indefinitely and persist in the healthcare environment is almost a guarantee it is going to spread throughout the population of ill people because they'll be in and out of the hospitals, in and out of our clinics, and we will all end up with this new yeast. Great, isn't that just beautiful? Okay, I'm hoping to get my picture on the cover of the Rolling Stone <laughs> because, you know what, it's just kind of like being a, uh, a lone voice out in the wilderness. This stuff is real. By enlisting all of you guys in this thinking pattern, I am able to say we are going to get there from here. Now, maybe we'll drag a lot of our friends and family and our patients with us, and maybe not. But the point is, okay, what we have to do is be different enough, be unique enough in our thinking patterns that we include fungus yeast, mold, mildew, as a serious threat to our health that we always have to treat, not sometimes, that we always have to address, not occasionally, that we always know is involved because it is. And I'll leave you with this parting comment, okay? Our logo is the, the man maneuvering unit up there in space. And the deal is, is that the space suit was developed. One of my patients said, you know your logo? And I said, yeah. She said, my husband designed that unit. Oh, okay. That's cool. That's what happens when you live in Houston. The spacesuit was designed to keep us safe. They took everything that they could understand in physics, biology, whatever, and developed a suit to keep us safe in the hostile environment of space. But our body, your body, each body, is the spacesuit that we wear now to keep us safe in the hostile environment of planet Earth. Because everything is trying to eat us, the bacteria, the fungus, the viruses, the worms, everything, all this stuff. And nutritional deficiencies are our responsibility. Toxic exposures are somewhat our responsibility, but doing something about it, doing something about it is what allows us to create that safety net of our own personal spacesuit. You have been a wonderful audience. I hope I've given you some expanded perspectives. Thank you.